prior to my work as an executive director, I, I worked in family law, uh, primarily in LGBTQ family law. Um, prior to that, I have a, a long and storied business background that you don't need to be bored with. Um, and I, I suppose that's probably all that's necessary and relevant for right now. Mark, you want to introduce yourself? Sure, uh, sure. Good morning uh, or good afternoon to everybody now that it's past 12. Uh, Thanks uh, for, uh, for hosting and for having us. Um, so I'm Mark Solomon. I'm a, a, a consultant with a firm called Civitas Public Affairs Group. Uh, for 15 years, I worked uh, full-time on marriage equality from uh, Massachusetts through the end and uh, spent um, the last five years uh, as national campaign director for Freedom to Marry. Um, I now work with other advocacy causes to get laws passed um, and feel really lucky to be working with Family Equality Council and a great coalition of, um, of organizations, including the LGBT uh, Center, um, to, uh, to advance, um, advance uh, the Child Parent Security Act here in New York and modernize laws for uh, LGBTQ um, families. And uh, so thanks. Okay. Um, well, I, I just uh, wanted to thank you again for joining us for this webinar. Um, uh, Family Equality Council is a, a national 40-year-old uh, organization that works to advance uh, the lived and legal equality for LGBTQ-headed families and those who wish to form them. And one of the areas that we have been a part of advocacy around has been the modernizing of law in New York State for the past uh, uh, seven or so years and the Child Parent Security Act is a is a piece of legislation that we have advocated for and are uh, and, and have decided to uh, start this coalition uh, um, in order to advance advance this important piece of legislation in New York this webinar today is going to focus on the medical advances in assisted reproductive technology that have occurred in the last 40 years since, or last 30 years um, since the infamous baby M case, which we'll, we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the current state of the law uh, around using uh, assisted reproductive technology, especially surrogacy uh, in New York State. We'll talk a little bit about the background on how that law came to be, and we'll uh, talk about an opportunity and the effort to change the law by passing the Child Parent Security Act. Um, and that's the legislation we're gonna spend a lot of time on today. Uh, and then finally, we'll let you know how you can get involved in the effort to help this uh, law get changed and the Child Parent Security Act become the new law of the state. Um, I guess to understand the bill, it's important that you understand the recent advances in medical technology and the current state of the law in New York. So that's where we'll start. Um, they, there have been significant advances in medical technology over the past three decades. Uh, evolutions to societal norms that have allowed for new options for people who are previously unable to have children. One of those options is gestational surrogacy. Gestational surrogacy is distinguished from what we call traditional surrogacy in that a fertilized egg is implanted into the gestational carrier who agrees to carry the fetus. And this egg is not related, is not the gestational carrier's egg. It is, it is a, an egg that has been donated by someone else. It's far more uh, common that people use gestational surrogacy today than they, than they have in the past, and certainly far more common than it existed 30 years ago when New York's laws that currently are on the books were passed. Um, gestational surrogacy and other forms of uh, assisted reproductive technology have been especially transformative for LGBTQ couples, many of whom obviously require assistance from an egg or a sperm donor and potentially a surrogate as well in order to have a, a child, in order to give birth to a child. In New York today, uh, unfortunately, um, the law have lagged behind most other states, uh, particularly around easing the burden for families who rely on 
ART or assisted reproductive technology, including technology, become uh, Many of New York's laws were enacted as a result of the Baby M case that I mentioned at the outset. It's a, this is a case from New Jersey in the late 1980s in which a surrogate decided to keep the baby. Now, remember, this was, this was her genetic child, and, and she had changed her mind. She had entered into a, an agreement to be a surrogate and, to, um, uh, and that the intended parents would become the parents of the child. And ultimately, the child did live with the intended parents, but the result of her changing her mind is what led to the baby M case. And, it's, and I think it's really important to note that in today's world, when we talk about gestational surrogacy and we go through the processes that, that um, agencies go through to, to match up gestational surrogates with intended parents, that just never happens now. You never see uh, a case where a gestational carrier uh, changes her mind. Um, there's just there's so many protections built in for the carrier. There's so many protections built in for the uh, parents, um, which ultimately lead to the protections for the child. That 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 we just don't see that anymore. Um, so nearly all surrogacy arrangements today are, as I said, done through uh, gestational surrogacy. Um, but New York's law doesn't allow for any type of surrogacy, not gestational, not traditional, any type of surrogacy. Um, and in fact, it is one of only two states that actually criminalize uh, surrogacy and voids all surrogacy contracts. So when New Yorkers want to go through surrogacy to form their families, they have to go out of state. And that's a significant uh, burden from a, a lot of perspectives, but obviously from time and expense, especially. New York laws, unfortunately, rely primarily on biology rather than the intention of the parents to determine parental rights. It is under current uh, law that state sperm and egg donors can be granted rights and responsibilities that they don't want. When you, when you decide that you're going to help somebody form a family and you donate your, your sperm or your egg, and your intention is to help somebody form a family, you don't, you, and, and you don't want to be a parent, the last thing on earth that you want to be told is that the law requires that you become a parent just because you have a genetic connection. Uh, and that's what the current law does. Or can do. Um, intended parents and their children are then, of course, forced into this limbo where they have to go through uh, expensive and time-consuming and sometimes um, uh, unsuccessful attempts to form their legal relationships with their children. Um, and obviously this is especially harmful to single people and lesbian couples who use sperm donors, uh, gay males, straight couples who work with a surrogate to have a child. Um, so uh, recently in, in um, the Advocate, if you, if you happen to see The Advocate, there is a, an article 50 years after Stonewall, it's time to protect LGBTQ families in which Karen Lowy from Lambda Legal and Evan Wolfson uh, from Freedom, former Freedom and Mary uh, had this great quote, it says, one example of the practical burdens imposed by New York law, despite parentage protections flowing from marriage, married lesbian couples who seek to become parents through the use of a sperm donor are still encouraged to undergo a full second parent adoption process to ensure the parental rights of the non-bio mother are protected when traveling outside of New York. This requires costly and intrusive criminal and child abuse clearances, medical certifications, and a home study, and can take months after the child is born. Other states have simpler, less expensive, and more humane legal processes that allow intended parents to obtain a court order of parentage Established that both members of the couple are legal parents before the child is born. And that is exactly, that's exactly what this is in a nutshell. Um, it, it might be useful also to talk a little bit about a real life story, a real life example of a family that was impacted by New York's current laws. Um, sure. Stacey, Did you want to do that or do you want me to? I'm happy please, to. Please, please jump in there, Mark. Sure, sure. So, yeah, just to pick up on where Denise is. I think one thing that's really important is, number one, updating the laws is not only about surrogacy. It's about uh, protecting 
essentially non-traditional families of all sorts. As Denise said, single people, uh, lesbian couples where one of the parents is non, the non-biological mom, um, gay couples who uh, need a surrogate, um, straight couples who need to work with a surrogate in order to have a kid. Um, and, you know, New York law just has been really behind the times across the board. So this couple, um, I, the, the other, you know, so th this couple is a couple that lives in, uh, lives in New York City. Um, one is a uh, firefighter. Um, actually, they're, they're, both, uh, they're both firefighters. One's with the New York City uh, Fire Department, the other's with the Air National Guard. Um, they decided to have a baby. Uh, they used a sperm donor. Uh, one of them carried the, uh, the child and the other didn't. Um, and, you know, their expectation going into uh, this uh, arrangement was that, you know, they are committed to one another. They're committed to bringing a family um, about and having a, having a child. And um, the notion was that once the baby was born, they'd both be uh, the parents and that's it. Um, unfortunately in New York, that's, it's not quite so easy. So um, what, what actually happened in this situation is um, that, uh, um, you know, after, after they had the kid, well, what, what they realized is that they couldn't get an order of parentage, an official order of parentage, um, before, uh, the, the baby was born. And, you know, because, you know, New York has decent laws to protect, um, married same sex couples, but in order to protect, um, their family, uh, in other States and in other countries, um, you know, they, it's, it's recommended lawyers recommend that you get, um, you know, the, the court rules that both parents are the legal parents. And unfortunately in New York, you can't, um, it's a really challenging process to do that. So they actually had to go through a second parent adoption process, which means they had to have um, social workers come in and interview them and, um, you know, and, and essentially deem whether um, the, uh, you know, the, the, the non-biological uh, mom, uh, Vanessa, was a, uh, you know, was a suitable um, mom. Um, they had to spend uh, thousands of dollars on legal bills, and it ended up taking a whole year before uh, this process was over with. Um, so, you know, the, the legal bills were about $5,000, which is not at all insignificant to a working class uh, family. So, um, you know, we wanted to show this, uh, you know, this example of how the laws are sort of screwed up in New York. Um, what would happen under the bill that we are uh, supporting, uh, the Child Parent uh, um, Protection Act would, um, is that, uh, you know, they would simply be able to go to a judge and ask for an order of parentage um, after the, uh, um, after the, uh, the, the, the future birth mom is pregnant, and that's it. And that would be simple. They could do it themselves. They wouldn't need lawyers. It would be done the, the, you know, in advance of when the child is born and uh, they wouldn't have to worry about it afterwards. So, um, you know, happy news is that they're a very happy uh, family. Um, they love Santa Claus and uh, all the other great things that families love. <laughs> but um, it was just a, a demeaning, inexpensive process to have to have somebody come into your home and um, explore whether or not, you know, you're good enough to be a parent when it's, you know, the kid that the two of you were, uh, were envisioning having. Yeah, so, so now we have an opportunity to fix that situation, right? We have an opportunity to make it easier for families like Vanessa and Stacy, as well as many other uh, families, LGBTQ people form families in, in a variety of ways, and the Child Parent Security Act seeks to create uh, ways for them to be able to access legal parentage and secure the relationship between the adults and the children in a less intrusive, less expensive, uh, more clear way, um, but still pro provides the full protection of the courts. Um, and so we have an opportunity this year to, to get uh, New York's laws passed or changed and update with, uh, up to date with medical technology. Um, and, and so 
because of these issues in New York, we, in order to raise awareness on this issue, to mobilize supporters, uh, to take action on this issue, Family Quality Council uh, formed the Protecting Modern Families Coalition, um, which is a group of LGBTQ, religious, infertility advocacy organizations, all dedicated to passing the Child Parent Security Act. And we feel very confident that the strength and breadth of this coalition will help the lawmakers in Albany to see the importance of updating the state's laws <clears throat> around surrogacy. Currently, we've got a number of organizations involved in the coalition, including the Academy for Adoption and Assisted Reproductive Attorneys, uh, the American Society for Reproductive Medicine, the Auburn Theological Seminary, Equality New York, Family Equality, of course, HRC, Lambda Legal, the LGBT Community Center of New York City, Men Having Babies, Resolve, which is the National Infertility Association, and Theological Seminary. So this is a this is a broad-based coalition, uh, all working just to modernize law. <clears throat> excuse me, to modernize law in the state of New York. And so let's turn now um, and talk about what the act itself actually does. Mark. Sure. So if you flip to the next slide, um, thank you, Nathan. Wait, um, Mark, before you start, I just want to remind folks that if you think of any questions um, or you have a question on anything that has been mentioned so far, feel free to type it in the chat function and we can take them once we start taking questions. Sure. So you know, the legislation um, has been introduced in the Senate and the Assembly. It's been around for um, you know, multiple years, uh, and uh, Senator Hoylman and Assembly Member Pollan are in the process of uh, um, making some updates to the bill. Um, it's also been uh, included as a priority by Governor Cuomo. He included it in his budget uh, proposal this year, which basically means that he's put his weight behind uh, getting the bill passed. Um, and what it does is it would, um, you know, secure the legal relationship between a child and intended parents uh, from birth. Um, that means that sperm donors and egg donors who have no interest um, in becoming uh, um, legal parents but want to, you know, contribute their sperm or egg um, would be able to um, not, uh, you know, never have to worry about whether they could be and end up uh, legal parents. Um, and uh, the, the parents, um, whether a single woman, um, a uh, lesbian couple, um, a straight couple, uh, um, could not, can be sure that the two parents or the one parent uh, are the legal parents uh, from birth on and that they never have to worry about, uh, about what, um, you know, what might happen if somebody changes their mind, a, a, a donor uh, changes their mind. And, and the same, you know, for the kid, and that's perhaps most important, is that the child has real certainty about who his or her parents uh, or parents is uh, um, from, you know, from uh, day zero. Um, it gets rid of the process that we described for lesbian couples uh, of having to go through a second parent adoption to absolutely be positive that they are both the parents in all situations. They'd be able to simply go to court and make sure that happens. Um, the you know when I've talked to the lawyers about the person who's the most vulnerable in this situation, it's it's single women um, who uh, rely on a sperm donor. There, there's there's no way for um, you know under law today in New York for that um, single woman to uh, sort of make sure that the sperm donor has no uh, rights to the child, even if he wants to sign a contract, et cetera, et cetera. There's no bulletproof way right now. So that's something that really needs to change. And then it would legalize gestational surrogacy in New York and um, set best practice uh, requirements. And when I say best practice requirements, it means ensuring that surrogates are fully uh, protected in the, uh, in the state of New York. And so we're going to talk a little bit, you know, the, the uh, surrogacy elements of the, of the bill are what 
garners the, certainly the most media attention. And so we want to talk through a little bit about what it means to protect um, surrogates and how the bill would, uh, would protect surrogates. So, you know, under the New York um, proposed law, um, the, uh, there would be a guarantee that surrogates have deep uh, protections. And, you know, we list them here uh, on the slide. Um, I think the most important ones, well, a bunch of them are important, but you know, the, the crucial area is that the surrogate has the sole right to make any um, uh, decisions, any and all decisions about her own uh, health um, or the fetus or embryo that uh, she is carrying. Um, and the sole right to terminate the pregnancy or reduce the number of fetuses that she is uh, carrying. Um, it also uh, requires that the surrogate and intended parents um, sign a detailed contract and it ensures that um, the surrogate has her own uh, counsel of her choosing um, to ensure that uh, she is an equal partner in this, uh, in this relationship. Uh, now, many of these are already standard practice in the United States and with, you know, the, the, the medical uh, and the legal uh, associations that do this, you know, that work with um, intended parents and surrogates already have a number of these uh, um, requirements. But this would put New York in a very select category, a small number of states uh, that uh, guarantees and ensures protections for surrogates um, under, uh, you know, in, in, in the code, in the law. So next, and I mentioned that, that uh, this would put New York in with a small number of um, states that, uh, you know, that offer these deep protections within the law for surrogates. Um, the states that are listed here are sort of the, you know, the progressive states that New York um, often likes to be uh, in the company of. And uh, these states are states that protect surrogates uh, under the law and also um, um, allow for uh, surrogates to uh, work with um, a bunch of different types of, uh, of, of families whose protections apply not just to a straight married couple, but also to a um, same-sex married couple and to single people. So. Um, you know, that, that's what we view as best practices in this area, and uh, we hope that New York joins the uh, cadre of states that, um, you know, that provide these protections and that allow for, uh, for surrogacy. And so here's how you can help us, um, and we really do need uh, plenty of help. Um, so number one is that we have a lobby day uh, on March the 6th in Albany. Uh, we'll be there from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. meeting with, uh, with lawmakers. Um, we could use uh, diverse representation from across the state to join us. Um, and uh, we would certainly help prepare you for meetings and the like. Um, uh, and you can learn more about it uh, at the email address at the bottom of the uh, screen. Um, you also, at that same email address, can send an email to your state senator and assembly member in support of the bill. Um, if you are part of an organization uh, who is, um, you know, that is interested in being part of this coalition, we'd love to have you, and uh, you should uh, get in contact with us. Uh, you'll see on the next slide how you can get in contact with us, um, or just go to the link below. Um, we'd love to have you post uh, support of the legislation and tag your state representatives, um, op-eds, letters to the editor, really the whole gamut of, um, of uh, you know, of, of activism is what's needed. And what's most important from, um, from people is to share your personal experience of why this is important, uh, whether you're a parent or a, someone who would love to be a parent um, or friend, family member, et cetera, of somebody who, um, you know, who has uh, benefited from advances in, um, you know, in, uh, um, you know, in assisted uh, reproductive technology and 
you know, would like to be able to avail themselves of, uh, of support here in New York. Um, uh, you know, that all of that is what we're really looking for. And that sort of takes us to the, uh, to the end. These are our two uh, names. Um, you can um, email us, call us, uh, um, ask for, uh, you know, and, and uh, let us know any thoughts, concerns, questions. Uh, we just love your, uh, love your help and, uh, and engagement. Thank you, Mark. Um, I want to just keep that slide up for a second um, uh, and remind people that if you do have questions, please feel free to share it in the chat. We did have um, a comment come in just reminding folks that there are a number of men and non-binary folks that are also acting as surrogates. Um, so to keep that in mind that it, the argument is not just um, singularly focused on women um, acting as surrogates. Um, related to that, I had a question, um, just because it seems from what you've presented so far that surrogacy as a pathway to parenthood seems pretty straightforward. Um, but in terms of like what kinds of arguments have been common um, to sort of oppose advocating for this, um, and what kind of messages should the community be focusing on in terms of messaging to really just drive the point home. Yeah, Denise, I can take that or you can either either way. I, I think we could both take a shot at that, Mark. I, okay. I think there's a there are a number of there are a number of arguments that that people opposed to this have raised. Um, most of them are grounded in um, what I would call outdated uh, thought processes um, and are primarily tend to focus on um, concern that surrogacy might somehow be exploitive of gestational carriers themselves um, and see it as a uh, women's rights issue um, in that regard. Uh, and, and a lot of that is based on the fact that uh, back in the early 80s, um, Governor Cuomo's uh, created a task force to look at the issue and that task force recommended uh, the existing law which, which prohibits surrogacy as a result, as I said, of the baby M case. But as time has changed and as, as thoughts have, have evolved and technology advanced, it's become very clear now that the conditions that were present then aren't present now, and that the protections that are provided to the gestational carrier, to the surrogate, are, uh, are so secure and so strong that it actually has transmogrified into sort of a women's rights issue on the other end, in, in, in our opinion, uh, where it is now a, a women's, it should be, in our view, a woman's right to choose what she wants to do with her body. Um, and, and, and I agree, uh, Trayvon, that this is, there's also a number of men um, and uh, gender nonconforming folks who act as surrogates. And, and the same is true in, in that case. So there are opportunities um, to lift the voices up of people who have been surrogates and who tell their story about the reasons that they were surrogates and, they, and the life-changing events that, that have followed as a result of that. And, and I think that does a lot to dispel those sort of outdated thoughts around um, exploitation, which just on the ground isn't, isn't what happens, isn't, what, isn't the report of, of surrogates today. Mark, do you have some other thoughts there? I think, I think you handled it really well. I think the, the, you know, the, other, the other element of opposition is sort of the usual suspects, of, um, you know, the Catholic hierarchy and, and people that don't want, you know, that, that really resist uh, modern advances in um, medicine to help people form families. So the notion of 
IVF and uh, embryo creation, all of that, you know, the people that oppose that also oppose, uh, um, not shockingly, oppose uh, surrogacy. That's right. Thanks, Mark and Denise. I have uh, one more question. <clears throat> uh, you showed a slide about states uh, that had best practices, and I'm just curious um, if there was any one state from that list that you um, thought would be sort of like the best model. Um, and just wondering if in terms of like data, there has been anything that showed sort of like um, how surrogacy laws in best practice states have um, sort of like played out? Um, I think that there are, you know, I'll take the first part of it and then I may need to ask you to repeat the second part. Um, the, for the first part, I think there are a number of states that have implemented different models of, of best practices, um, but they all share some core elements in common. They share the, um, the, the need to protect all parties. They share the, the importance of having everybody represented by counsel uh, that is independent so that even though the intended parents may pay for the lawyer for the gestational carrier, the gestational carrier's um, legal counsel is not beholden to the intended parents, but rather has only the interests of the, just the carrier in mind. Um, they, they share some other common uh, traits. I think in terms of a model, um, New Hampshire comes immediately to mind as one that has recently passed. Um, but um, I think they all have, they all have elements that we, that we've drawn upon and drawn from. And now what was the second part of your question? I'm sorry. Um, just wondering in states that most recently uh, passed uh, surrogacy laws, if there has been any data on like spikes and increases of folks that are use, utilizing surrogates or anything like that. I'm wondering if that might be sort of like another lens to look at sort of the demand for how people um, want uh, New York laws to be updated. I think that there, there probably isn't a lot of data on that yet because some of this is so current, so new. Um, and it's, it's important to understand that when you look at the map that's currently on the screen, um, what, what is not highlighted here are Michigan and New York, which, which actually void surrogacy contracts altogether. But all the rest of that gray is, are, are a bunch of states that don't regulate it through statutory mechanisms. And so surrogacy has been going on um, in lots of places around the country for a while, but hasn't necessarily been regulated in a way that protects the interests of everybody involved. It's sort of like the Wild West out there and whatever, you know, if you get the right judge, then it might go this way. And if you get the wrong judge, it might go the wrong way and, and that kind of thing. So, um, so I think surrogacy itself is a fairly well accepted and, and, and longstanding uh, process. It's just that I don't think we have any data uh, as directly relates to the passage of these laws, uh, these recent laws. Thanks, Denise. Thanks, Mark. Um, if there are no other questions, um, I just wanted to thank you all again for taking the time today to join our webinar and for all of um, your thoughtful insight. Um, also want to just thank uh, Mark and Denise for an insightful overview. Um, I will be following up uh, with everyone who joined the webinar and others who expressed interest in receiving a recording of the presentation, um, just to have some time to unpack it a little bit more. So that will be made available as well. Um, if you have any additional questions in the interim, please feel free to feel free to reach out to Denise or Mark uh, Solomon. Their uh, contact information is on the screen, um, or you can reach out to me directly. But thank you all again. Thank you for joining. Thank you. Thanks for having us.